Welcome back, everybody, to Jason's Weather School. I'm meteorologist Jason Fraser from the NBC affiliate here at WKYC 3 News. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit about earthquakes as well as building codes and how were they changed over the last couple of years. So as always, I like to start off with something funny. And my joke for today is, uh, again, about snowmen. So what do you call a snowman who tells a lot of lies? No fake. Get it? They're fake because they tell a lot of lies. Okay. I thought. All right. So as always, love your questions, comments, concerns, short speeches. If you have one, please let me know what you think about everything. Uh, you can feel free to send me an email to jfrazer at wkyc.com or feel free to leave a comment right below on the link. All right, so today we're going to be talking about earthquakes again. We're going to do a little basic review. Then we're going to talk uh, about where they happen and why they happen in that particular occasion the most. And we're going to talk about how building codes have changed over the years to make buildings much more safer during earthquakes and what the United States is basically doing to ensure that that happens. So let's begin with the earthquake basics. As I mentioned yesterday, an earthquake is nothing more than a shaking of the ground due to either tectonic plates or volcanoes. There are a few other things that do happen to make the ground shake, but those are the two pretty much most popular ones. So as this happens, it can be really scary and you're like, what is going on? No. Yes, that's pretty much what we call an earthquake. So remember I had mentioned that for the most part, earthquakes were caused by either volcanic activity or the tectonic plates. They move in different directions, similar to this cup, as well as this bottle, right? Sometimes they move together, sometimes they move against each other, sometimes they move towards you and against you. They move in all sorts of different directions. And this happens very slowly. We're talking about four inches per year. And this is in what we call them, the lithosphere but I'll get to more of that in a second. So the danger from all of this really comes from the fact that you never know what is going to happen, when is it going to happen, and the damage can certainly vary because we don't know when it's gonna happen. It could happen tonight, so it could happen tomorrow, it could happen next week, next month, next year, and depending on where you are is how severe some of these earthquakes could be. Now, for the most part, Earthquakes actually do happen every day. You really don't feel them. But it is the bigger earthquakes that are always a concern for scientists like me because you just never are prepared. And depending on where you are and the type of building that you're in and maybe even a bridge, you might be on a bridge, you just never know. And that's why I always get very concerned. And that's why we're here today is to try and teach you a couple of things about earthquakes so that if and when it does happen. Prepared. So remember, I mentioned that the strongest earthquake ever was in Chile, and that was back on March the 22nd, 1960. It ranged anywhere between a 9.4 to a 9.6 in magnitude and 5,700 people had died. And as a result of this earthquake, there was a lot of talk about whether or not they should redo all of the buildings. There was a lot of talk about what things that they could do to ensure that people don't die from earthquakes. Now, Chile in a part of the world that we call the Ring of Fire. And you can see the image right there. Thank you to wikipedia.com for supplying this image. And you'll notice here that it pretty much is in the ocean, the Pacific Ocean. So it's all these countries right here. So Chile, uh, you have Mexico right here. You have our country, the United States, parts of Canada, then Alaska. And then you start getting into places like uh, the Eastern part of Europe, uh, including the Philippines, and then you go all the way down here, and then you have Australia. So again, Ring of Fire, it is located in the Pacific Ocean, and this is where many of the worst earthquakes in the world happen, and it's all due to not only tectonic plates, but also some underwater volcanic eruptions. Now, 75%, it's estimated, 
75% of the world's volcanoes are here and they are some of the most active, okay? 90% of the world's earthquakes happen in this ring of fire. And please don't think that the ring of fire is actually fire. It's not, but it kind of sort of is just because of all the volcanic activity and all of the really cool things that pop up out of the volcanoes that kind of look like fire. Some of it kind of is fire, but you'll have to listen to my volcano lesson coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, but again, Ring of Fire, home to about 90% of some of the strongest, strongest uh, earthquakes that happen. And again, this is all because of its location. Now, it happens to be uh, in a place where there's a lot of tectonic plate movement. And it's located in what we call the lithosphere, okay? And that is directly above the Earth's crust. That's where we start to get all of those tectonic plates that are moving. And I don't want to bore you, but there are actually different levels within the Earth below ground, all right? And they all surround the Earth's crust, which, whoo, it is really, 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 really hot down there. There is a lot of different things that are going on underground. And as a result of that, that's the reason why these plates are. So speaking of things that are happening underground, you might be wondering why earthquakes actually happen. Like what's going on with the tectonic plates that makes them actually vibrate and cause the earthquakes or these volcanic eruptions. All right, so we have this thing called subduction. And what basically happens is you have one plate that moves under another plate and eventually the plate that's getting moved up doesn't really like it and there's a whole bunch of energy that's released and then voila, you either have a volcanic eruption which leads to an earthquake or you have a just an earthquake. So the best way to describe it is if I took, again, water bottle, glass, right? and I did that to it, what just happened there? Yep, the glass moved out of the way. Why? Because energy was transferred from this bottle to this glass. Yep, there you go. It would be really cool if I could just like really knock it and then it would just go all the way over there and it would crash and yeah, it would make a whole bunch of mess. It would just be really cool to see, but I don't think my wife would appreciate that. <laughs> anyway, this essentially is what happens with subduction. Again, it is when one plate, like this moves under another plate and then inevitably one plate ends up going up and up and up and it gets to a point where there's so much energy that it just starts vibrating and sometimes that can actually cause volcanoes to erupt as well then we have something called divergent place boundary all right so what that basically means is instead of the plates instead of one of the plates going under one of the other plates it actually ends up going in the opposite direction. So they're together at some point, and then they start separating. And what happens is there's actually energy underneath that divergent plate boundary. And as it starts to separate, it starts releasing all of that energy. So again, if I have two plates here, all right, I'm gonna try and hold this here, all right? If I have two plates that are like this, and they're starting to separate, Let's say then I'm gonna just use this piece of paper here. There's gonna be a little bit of energy that's down here that's basically underneath these two plates. And as these two plates start moving in a direction, that extra energy is gonna start moving upwards. And that's where we start to get some e uh, e or earthquake activity. Now, here's the thing. It's not really much. Most Really strong earthquakes actually happen as a result of subduction in the uh, in the ring of fire. Okay, with divergent plate boundaries, yes, you can have a little tiny, tiny, tiny earthquake. You can have just a little bit of uh, I'll call it rumbling on the ground here, but for the most part, you're not going to get really big earthquakes with this. Now, there's one other plate boundary I want to tell you about. It's called transform. Plate boundaries, we usually don't see much activity with this in terms of uh, volcanoes or even um, e even a lot of land that's 
uh, messed up. And usually the reason why is because again, instead of the plates either moving apart or moving towards one another, they're actually sliding in opposite directions. So unless they're actually clipping one another as they're doing that, there's usually not a lot of energy that's associated with it. I just wanted to mention that this way somebody says to you, hey, why is the ring of fire? Why does that happen and why is it so crazy? I wanted you to be able to know about the different uh, plate boundaries and, and what happens. So because energy happens, right, that energy is moved upward, it's vibrated, sometimes it actually happens in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And as you know, as a mini scientist, you know that if one thing happens, that means that there has to be something else that happens as a result, right? So remember, as we go back to, if I have this cup, I slap it, right, bam, this cup's gonna have to move because energy is being transferred from the bottle to the glass. That happens with earthquakes, all right? Uh, and the reason why we know that that happens is because of something called tsunamis. And tsunamis basically are nothing more than water that is raised above whatever its normal level is, and it goes really, 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 really fast, all right? It doesn't always have to hit land. Sometimes it can actually stay out to sea, but for the most part, we as human beings only recognize it whenever it actually uh, hits, the, uh, hits the surface. Now, that brings up my next point, which is what areas of the United States are most prone to earthquakes? I would say for the most part, people generally have heard of California. But there are earthquakes that happen all across the country. But California, because of its location right along that ring of fire, it tends to happen in California the most. Uh, Alaska also gets a fair amount of earthquakes. As well. The area least prone to earthquakes in the United States, Florida and North Dakota. And that is because of where they're located. They're not really located near a lot of tectonic plates. Now, some parts of it are closer than others, but for the most part, it's not, it's not next to a place where there's a lot of activity going around. Now, countries that are most prone to earthquakes, there's a couple of them. And again, it really depends on where they are. And where did we say the most earthquakes happen? Right around that ring of fire. So if you ever forget about these countries that I'm about to mention, just look at a map and look at where the Pacific Ocean is, and I can guarantee you it's somewhere in there. So the countries that are most prone to earthquakes include Japan, Indonesia, Fiji, and China, all right? Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of earthquakes in other parts of the world, like Chile, for example, or Mexico, but these are countries that tend to see it more. Now, there are countries that are least prone to earthquakes. And Antarctica, well, it's more of a continent than a country, but that area is least prone because of its location. So because earthquakes happen, and because most people tend to spend a lot of time indoors, we have to make sure that we are very careful in how buildings are built, right? So because what happens is when we build a building and the ground shakes, what inevitably ends up happening? Well, the building also shakes and then it falls down and we don't want that to happen. So what a lot of countries have started doing about a hundred years ago is they started analyzing, well, what are things that we can do to make sure that the buildings are safe? And that's when they came up this thing called building codes. And building codes are pretty much rules that people should follow whenever they're constructing a building. Now, most of the buildings in the United States are built directly on the ground, right? So let's say this is the ground, I build my building there, and that's it. But in other countries, because of when there's an earthquake, the ground shakes, and then that means everything else in here shakes, that tends not to be a very good thing. Because remember what we said, when the ground shakes, the building shakes, and then that means whoosh, the building ends up coming down or things start falling on top of people. So they came up with this thing called base isolation. Now, this was an idea that was developed in the 1920s 
And then some developers got together in the 1980s and sort of rehashed this. But basically what this means is they place these bearings between the building, between the bottom of the building and the ground. And the way it works is instead of, let's say this is, let's say this is the bearing, this is my building on top of it. What happens is the bearing goes on the ground and the building goes on, on top of the bearing. And what happens is this, as the ground starts moving, what do you notice happens? The bottle moves, but the building doesn't move as much. It still moves, but it doesn't build, it doesn't move as much. And they call this base isolation. It's pretty similar to the suspension in your car, right? So what happens is you go over, a bump or you go over a pothole, which I absolutely hate, right? And what happens is there's a suspension underneath your car that is designed to absorb a lot of the energy that is associated with that massive bump that you just hit going at 20, 30, 40 miles per hour, all right? Without the suspension, what would end up happening is your entire car would, well, let's just say it would be ruined, okay? You would feel it, it would just be like boom. And you were just, yeah, it, it wouldn't be a good thing. So the suspension in your car basically absorbs a lot of that energy. So the bumps don't necessarily feel as All right, so because of the changing of the building codes, a lot more states, or I should say a lot more countries are starting to really figure out how to do this. But this is really, 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 really expensive to do because essentially what you have to do is you have to dig deeper into the ground, somehow install these things, and then make sure that the building is on the same level, all right? And this diagram basically shows us how uh, that's done. So with a, they call it a conventional structure, but basically just a regular building. Remember I mentioned, it's just on the ground, that's it. So as that ground shakes, yeah, that also shakes as well. As you can see, I got an A in art. Okay, but again, these bearings that are right here, they kind of look like little struts. Again, what ends up happening is as that shakes, the building doesn't necessarily move as much, which is a really cool. So in Chile, for example, um, because of that really, 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 really big earthquake that we had talked about uh, in the 1900s, they actually have some of the strictest rules in the world for new buildings. So all of their buildings, any new building that, is, that was built as of today, it has to be able to withstand an earthquake that is 9.0 or larger. So what has happened as a result is, even though the, the, the country has seen a couple of earthquakes, um, what we've noticed is that some of the buildings only really have just a few cracks in it, and that's okay. The other thing is everybody that lives in, in Chile um, they have to know what their evacuation plan is. Because if there is a earthquake, and this is all part of the building codes and making sure that, you know, when you move into a place or maybe you rent space that everybody knows how to evacuate, because in the event that there's an earthquake, there may not be a way to uh, get out using an elevator. You may have to have a, another way of getting out. Uh, the other thing that the Chileans have done is they have implemented a siren system. Uh, it's very similar to how we have tornado sirens, where they will go off either during or after a, um, a earthquake. Here in the United States, they tend to happen before or during a tornado. So that's because sometimes you really can't anticipate an earthquake before it actually happens. All right, so I've thrown a lot of information at you today. Hopefully you learn one or two things. Tomorrow we're gonna be continuing earthquakes, and we're going to be discussing tsunamis, which are pretty interesting to see, but they can also be very scary. So we're going to be talking a little bit about the dynamics of tsunamis, like how does a tsunami actually happen? And then we're going to be also discussing what to do if you see a tsunami coming at you. Um, and I can tell you right now, you only have a couple of minutes to prepare if and when that ever happens. As always, love your questions. You can feel free to email them to me, jfrazer at wkyc.com, or feel free to leave me a message on any of the social medias, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, as well as Snapchat. 
at Jason Fraser TV. Have a great day, everyone.